The following content is for entertainment and educational purposes only. It does not constitute means for diagnosis, healthcare advice, nor treatment. Make use of a qualified healthcare professional for such purposes. Information contained in this video represents the views and opinions of the persons expressing them and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of a PhD teaches you, the channel's creator, its subscribers, or sponsors. The opinions do not constitute an endorsement nor the views noted by any government or private agency. There were some minor changes in the revised edition. The DSM 5 TR has come out this summer, and there's some minor um, differences. The are they're very minor. It's, I think, instead of saying, and actually, this one says, as manifested by all of the following is the new change, right. instead so, of by some or by the following. Yeah. They just wanted to make sure that people understood that all of these things need to be in play in order to get an ASD diagnosis. So all of the following, and this can be historically, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have it today. It means that at some point, historically, the person has had all of these things. The first one, of course, is a social or emotional difficulty. So um, difficulty communicating, difficulty, not in verbal communication, but more of the emotional. Okay, that was a change from the four to the five, because it used to just be current. Current. So we have to be careful when we're talking history, because we want to make sure that it's really autism and not situational. Okay, so if they have trouble socially because they just moved to a new place, obviously that's not going to qualify. That doesn't qualify. The second one is deficits in nonverbal communication and behaviors. And the third is deficits in developing, maintaining and understanding relationships. So, and they give examples. DSM is really good in the five to give examples. Now there is a requirement for specifying the severity. And this is where that umbrella, where it was in the four, it was Asperger's, PDD, NOS, and autism. We now have autism as the umbrella and everything fits under there. So we no longer have an Asperger's diagnosis. We no longer have an um, PDD, NOS, pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified, which is PDD, NOS. So that, that's changed from four to five. So when a person comes in and they say I have Asperger's, they probably were diagnosed under that, but it's all under ASD now. So some of the other things that you may see, um, and for the diagnosis, it would have to be at least two of some of these things. We might see restrictive behaviors, repetitive patterns, repetitive or restrictive interests. And so sometimes you'll see flapping or some type of other self-stimming. That tends to be in the more profound or some, on, some of them will line up toys. Sometimes they'll want to sort things but they like always want to do it. It's not like, oh, I just feel better if I can play with something. It's, I obsess over sorting everything. I can't just go in a room. I'm gonna sit there in the room and start sorting. Inflexibility is a huge issue, but we also see this in ADHD. So you wanna be careful not to just say ADHD or ASD. So, you know, having a meltdown because you're wanting me to stop playing or whatever, those things can be seen in a couple of other things, not just ASD. So you want to kind of look at the whole picture. Restricted or fixed interests. One of the things that you'll find is they always want to only do the same thing. Like I have one client, all he ever wants to do is play Uno. That's it. I never want to do anything else. Don't make me go into the sand room. Don't let me, don't play any other game with me. All we do here 
this location is for UNO and UNO only. Now, hyper or hypo reactivity sensory input where a child, for some reason, has a trigger and boom, they're way up. It might be physical sensory. It could be the lights in the room. You can also have um, hypo reactivity, like a loud noise, and they don't even really pay attention to it. So you can have it either direction. So usually we'll see two of these fit somewhere in along with the first uh, criteria A requirement. Let me go to CD and E. CD and E symptoms must be present in early development. So a lot of times when we get kids that are on, high on the spectrum and they've, mom's been working with them and they, they've been having a little struggle at school, they're a tween. We have to really dig in with whoever the caregiver is that knows the early development of the child. Most of the time there were symptoms at two and three and four years old. So my son at three years old was still not talking. Walk on his toes, yep. would only eat certain foods. Yeah, mine would sit for an, at two years old. Now think about this. If you've had children and you've had a two-year-old, you know this is not normal behavior. He would sit for hours and play Legos mm -hmm. and never move. We need to make sure that it's actually impairing them socially, occupationally, school. We, we have to make sure that it's actually causing the impairment. My son at this point, although he had a diagnosis of Asperger's back in the day, still has a lot of those things. It's no longer affecting him socially. He has learned the skills necessary in order to function in the world. It's no longer a, an issue for him. So even though legally he has that diagnosis, Reality is he has learned very good coping strategies. Um, I would get a lot of people say, well, that kid can't be um, autistic because they make good eye contact. Well, that kid was taught. Taught, to make good right. eye yeah. Started doing social skills at six years old, seven years old. And we began that, we began behavior or emotion regulation at seven. You know, we, we had all, we had started, I basically brought him home specifically to work on those things. Because at first grade, he was still only diagnosed with ADHD. Pharmacology for people on the spectrum, they'll put them, because of the hyperactivity, they'll put them on an ADHD medicine, but that isn't always the best option. And teaching them the skills is going to always be the better option for them because it's just a difficult thing. Now, we can't teach them self-regulation as well when they're six and five and four. It's more difficult. None of this can be explained better by an intellectual disability, although that can be comorbid. There are basically multiple specifiers with or without accompanying intellectual impairment with or without language impairment, which can happen associated with uh, no medical or a genetic condition. So sometimes there's a genetic condition. That's interesting because autism has a very big genetic component to it. Yes. This can be like, like a person on that has charge syndrome, which is a specific genetic okay. disorder could have some of the same symptoms, mm -hmm. very often has some of the same symptoms, but that's not specifically ASD. We are probably not going to see the third or the second level of severity. We will probably see the first level of sever severity, but be aware that the third level of severity is probably not going to come in. They tend to not be able to talk. They don't cope well. It's just a lot of severe deficits. So the only reason that I really want to point this one out is because you may see this come in. They can, sometimes they get passed and into us because, you know, their parents are only thinking about behaviors. They're not thinking about what other things are going on. So making sure that you understand that there are verbal and nonverbal social skill deficits, social impairment, limited social interactions, abnormal responses to social situations. So you'll see the high function. They're, they're, they're smart. They're intelligent. They're capable of, of do, making choices. That's one, that's a level one, okay? A level two, they're gonna seem a lot less able to communicate to you their needs or be able to interact with you. They tend to be more like fixated on one thing. They don't wanna make changes. You'll see that with the others, but 
there will be much more. So 10 year old is acting like a five year old or a six year old. Okay, so in the playroom, he has the behaviors of a five or six year old instead of a 10 year old. So you see a definite deficit. There's mm -hmm. not a, a trauma piece involved okay. in that. Level one, they do require some support, but their support is very minimal and they can outgrow their level of support. Like I said, I have a son who is living a real life, okay? But the skills have to be taught and that has to be done not just here one hour a week. It has to be done at home. Mm -hmm. It has to be done at school. Those supports and those educational pieces have to be everywhere. I can't just be in one place or another. So working with parents is imperative. Your parents have to know. Working with the school, if this child is in a, in a public setting, working with the school, if he's not already in a situation where they're helping him with or her. It, it depends on your child situation, what's going on, whether they're in a foster home, whether they, all of these things will make a difference. But a lot of times what I'm doing is with the parents once I do, I meet with the parents once a month. And I say, okay, what behaviors are you noticing? I give them homework to write down and log what, what's happening. Mm -hmm. What is the antecedent to the behavior? What were the triggers? What are you noticing? And I have them keep a log. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing we do. They, I want them to start paying attention. I also teach them to monitor their own regulation because a lot of times in those homes, mm -hmm. there is a parent or two that will have difficulty with their own emotion regulation. Well, mm -hmm. And so I also teach parents emotion regulation ASD or no ASD. with right. or without ASD. That's right. And then to add to that, I teach parents some of the parenting skills necessary, mm -hmm. and I help them work with the child on how to continue what we're doing in therapy. Mm -hmm. But I'm not telling them what we're talking about in therapy. I'm basically just asking What's the behavior happen? What's happening now? Mm -hmm. And here's some ways you can thwart that or, you know, avoid that or help that or improve that or, or whatever. And so I'm not ever disclosing the personal information that the child is giving me unless I have asked the child if it's okay 